I'm not sure it's everything to do with pests, but um, we'll see how far we get. I've got an extra 10 minutes, so you get me droning on for even longer if you, if you don't behave anyway. So um, oh, I've got too many things. So, uh, so as you probably are aware, we've reorganized and uh, we have AHDB, Crop Health and Protection, which covers all of the three crop sectors. Um, I'm focusing largely on the arable side of things today, but some of the things I say are more relevant to horticulture or perhaps potatoes um, or indeed all three. So what I hope to do is really just um, remind you, hopefully, of what the problem is and why we're facing issues and why you need to think very hard about any recommendations that you make. Um, and then what we do in order to support you and uh, growers make the right decisions and then at the end, hopefully lead through a few examples that will probably go through into the workshops this afternoon if you signed up to those as well. So what is the problem? Well, I think this is one of the uh, contributory factors, and that's the fact that we're getting fewer and fewer actives through onto the market. You're probably aware that the, uh, the toolbox is shrinking in essence, uh, and this just highlights the impact over time uh, on the cost of developing a new agrochemical. So, 1995, about $152 million. Now, a couple of years ago, $286 million. And a lot of that is about delivering the, the environmental part of the assessment. So it's getting more expensive to develop new chemistry. Um, so that's simply one of the reasons. Uh, and then this just uh, emphasizes that um, this is how we're spending our money or how the industry is spending it on its money on looking at different elements of the registration process. So product launch and development uh, gradually becoming slightly larger. It just gives an overview of what it costs to, to go through the process. So 2014, somewhere around 2.6 billion. Um, by 2019, that's estimated to be about $3.2 billion. So it's costing more, uh, and that's one reason why we're not getting so many. The other side of it is that even if we are searching for new actives, um, so the synthesis part is going on, 1995, looking at 52,500 uh, potential chemicals. Uh, four through, went through to development, one got registered. By the time we get to 2010-14, uh, searching through about 160,000 different chemicals, only one and a half went through to development and only one become registered. So that's over a four-year period, this is over a single year. And this is the time it takes to get to market, so it's getting longer and longer. So these are the tools that you've got to use when you're out in the field. So it's important that you remember that it's getting more and more difficult to produce these things. The other side of it is, is that we're very good at getting rid of our own tools in a sense, so inducing resistance. And this just gives a picture for insecticides. Um, ever since we kicked off with some of the chemistry after the First World War, uh, first documented case, 1914. So it's not new, um, but maybe we haven't learned because we're continuing to do it. So we've now got 586 species of insects resistant to insecticides. This is globally. Um, and then uh, we've got, uh, sorry, yes, and 325 insecticides uh, we have resistance to. And then we've even managed to do it with uh, the GM traits as well. Um, so we're pretty good at that. Uh, it'd be nice if we weren't quite so good at it, but uh, that's where we are. And then if you look, uh, across the board, fungicides and herbicides, same sort of uh, figures. So we have got a reduction in the toolkit, um, so we need to think very carefully about what we do, how we use it. So what do we do and why do we do it? Well, we do it because the farmer, uh, who is the person who pays our wages, um, and also yours, I suspect, uh, needs to have the best advice in order to make good, strong decisions. So it's about addressing the challenges we face, um, it's about preparing the industry not for the challenges, or not just for the challenges we face at the moment, but also into the future. Um, the biggest <coughs> elephant, which is not in the room, or is in the room, or maybe it is the room, is Brexit. Um, and how do we prepare the industry for that? Uh, and we do that through undertaking bare bits of R&D, uh, coming up with solutions, and the focus increasingly um, not least because the sustainable use directive is through uh, an integrated pest management approach and i guess ultimately it should be an integrated crop management approach so what are these challenges well resistance is a big one as i've already said um, and uh, that occurs some extent through insurance spraying calendar spraying um, so the more we can do to inform that and perhaps move people away from it is good uh, legislation 
Um, product withdrawals, re-registrations, getting products to market in the first place is a big influencing factor. And we've got the environmental component on that, and obviously that's just uh, perhaps a bit of a nod to neonics and, and bees. Um, we've got weather, which are driven uh, with changes in weather through climate change. So looking further forward, uh, rotations are impacted by three crop rules and those sorts of things as well. So a whole raft of things that, that can impact on what we try to do. Right. Um, so in order to try and deliver solutions, uh, and this is possibly more the horticultural side of things, we do interact with most of the uh, agricultural chemical companies, uh, crop protection companies, um, and we're seeking to find solutions um, maybe ahead of the, 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 uh, the point at which we don't have one. Um, so we will work with them to identify chemicals coming through onto the market to see if we can get those registered uh, for some of the minor crops as well. We do work with uh, CRD um, <clears throat> and gather intelligence, talk with them, see what's coming down the line, um, Food Standards Agency around uh, MRLs and that side of thing, uh, to try and anticipate what is going to be the impact of those activities. And we also work, and this, should, this is disproportionately small, it should be much bigger, um, with a resistance action uh, group, so with uh, insecticide, weeds, uh, and disease group, so we can keep track of what's happening in terms of resistance. And one way we try to do this is to, is to look uh, across a particular crop, look at all of the threats to that crop, the, the pest, weed, or disease, uh, and then think about... Uh, the individual pests here, the targets, the number of approved active ingredients, um, number of different uh, uh, resistance categories that exist within those. Um, are they likely to be affected by endocrine disruptor legislation? Should that ever get through? Uh, are they candidates for substitution? Um, which are ones that are due for um, uh, renewal? So looking at that, we can anticipate where gaps might appear in, in the armory. Um, and then we have a priority from industry to say this is a really key pest in terms of uh, this particular crop. And we're trying to do that right across the board for all of the crops, uh, whether it's in, in cereals, oil seeds, um, horticulture, potatoes as well. So we've also tried to anticipate what those impacts will be in order to inform our decision making as to where we focus the R&D and try and get the information out. Some of these are in terms of economic uh, impacts. So the, uh, the, the obvious one is the, the endocrine disruptors. Um, and as you may or may not know, there was an agreed definition uh, out of the, um, the Commission, uh, but the European Parliament said that that was not, uh, that it was beyond their remit with that particular definition because they were saying they should exclude. Uh, endocrine disruptors, which or chemicals that were designed to be endocrine disruptors, which seemed a strange thing to do. So, so we struggle with that. Um, we also have the issue around glyphosate. So there's a, a meeting. I've got the date now. I did write it down. It's uh, on the 25th of October, which um, it says there'll be an exchange of views and possible opinion uh, from the um, the standing committee on pesticides. So. Possibly, probably by that date, we will know whether we have glyphosate for another 10 years. Um, so that would be an interesting one to look out for. Uh, neonicotinoids, again, um, I don't know what the world would look like post neonicotinoid use or even post glyphosate use, but that's also on the agenda for discussion uh, at, the, uh, at the standing committee. Um, and uh, we, it's difficult to anticipate where that will go, to be perfectly honest. Maybe Keith will have an opinion later on, I don't know. Um, he's smiling ruefully because uh, he probably doesn't know any more than I do. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> um, so we try to keep up to date with legislation. So we try to encourage people to think about the whole spectrum uh, of issues that, that face us and also the potential impacts of, of what we do. And obviously effects on beneficials are uh, important. We, don't, we want to minimize that where possible. Uh, we need to keep track of what's going on in terms of, uh, of resistance and uh, we also need to think about cost and that one may come first, I don't know. But ultimately what our research is seeking to do is to give you the tools, the support to uh, set up, back up the, uh, the thresholds that um, you may wish to, to implement. And 
Hopefully you're all familiar with the idea of pest thresholds, um, but just in case it slipped your mind or you were never taught it in the first place, uh, what we're trying to do is to give you a tool that allows you to anticipate when the, uh, the rise in your, your pests, if you like, it becomes economically worthwhile uh, to control. So we're trying to avoid hitting this economic injury level. And if we take a action at the threshold uh, there, then we should end up with our pests declining. Um, all very well in theory, uh, perhaps rather more difficult to achieve in practice. But if you don't have the information, you won't be able to achieve it. So part of our role is to give you that information so you can, uh, can go forward. Um, so you clearly need to know about the pests. Uh, and the reason I was staggering on with this as well is I think that uh, this is um, probably a key publication. I don't know how many of you have it already. You may already have it in your uh, bag. Um, but it is our encyclopedia of pests and natural enemies. So it gives you information about uh, pretty much everything you might find in a field um, of a crop. So uh, that's one way in which we can support you. Um, but there's an awful lot of pests in there. Uh, and I think the, the question is, uh, how do you monitor them all? Well, you could do it yourself. Um, I suspect that may be impractical, and some of your individual companies will do some of that monitoring as well. But you can also access the HDB online monitoring tools. You can look at some of the instance surveys, and you can also follow up and sign up to the newsletters so you get up to the information coming through uh, weekly or however frequently is appropriate. So we're trying to prepare the industry, and obviously one of the key things over the past few years has been cabbage stem flea beetle. Um, are we going to lose neonicotinoids across the board? We've obviously already lost them in oilseed rape, uh, which has uh, resulted in, in uh, significant problems in certain areas of the country um, and problems in other areas. Uh, so the switch has been towards use of pyrethroids for autumn control of cabbage stem flea beetle. Um, and we know that there's also uh, the development of resistance uh, within those pests. Um, and that's been quite obvious where people have perhaps put on maybe two, three, four applications sometimes um, of uh, pyrethroids to control cabbage stem flea beetle. And it's been pretty ineffectual. So understanding whether your population is resistant is important. Um, we've carried out national assessments of the incidence of these uh, beetles to try and support getting uh, emergency approval of, of neonicotinoids, which was successful one year, but not subsequent years. We've reviewed biology and control. Um, we've got a project looking at uh, IPM of cabbage stem flea beetle, um, and that has involved us working with NFU, people like yourselves, and obviously levy pairs as well. And that's a sort of synthesis of information. So this is one of our information sheets, um, all of which are available on the website, some of which are probably available on the tables out there as well, um, which gives you a good sort of detailed information about particular pests. Slugs, another target. Um, lost methylcarb. We've got metaldehyde currently, but obviously the issues around the sustainable uh, water directive um, is, is uh, a, a, as an issue. Um, we do have ferric phosphates. We're currently funding uh, a PhD at Harper Adams, which is trying to better understand the, uh, the ecology of the slug um, and therefore be able to develop precision application. Um, there's also another project going on, uh, which is funded by Innovate, which is actually an idea of someone who used to work for uh, the Defence Science Agency um, in explosives. But I'm, I'm told it's nothing to do with explosives, um, but it might be an interesting solution. I can't say any more because I'm... I'm bound to secrecy, um, but it's quite exciting. So similarly, uh, information about slugs uh, and uh, how best to control them with the information that we have at the moment. And I think we've also got um, leaflets out on the desk outside uh, around the voluntary initiative and, and uh, how to use metaldehyde uh, safely and sensibly. We bowl fly, another one of the activity areas. Um, each year we, we get ADAS to undertake a survey, do an egg counts, uh, and give information. Um, so this goes back to 2000 and no, it goes back to uh, 1984. Um, so it gives you an idea of the variability, uh, the threshold of 250 eggs per meter squared. Uh, that used to be sort of the threshold. That's now been refined, and I would encourage you to 
uh, read more about that uh, to understand where the threshold now lies and what other factors you need to take into account. So we've lost chlorpyrifos, we've lost dimethoate, so the opportunities for control in the field uh, post sowing have pretty much disappeared. Um, so we're now down to seed treatments, so it has to be a, a pre uh, sowing decision that gets made. So understanding what the, uh, the, the, the intensity of, of uh, um, wheat bowl fly is an important decision in that process. So that gives you an idea of where the problem areas are. As you can see, concentrated in the east largely, um, but uh, they do exist elsewhere and, and there may be local issues as well. So again, another fact sheet available for you to uh, dig out the information in full and there's information on the, on the thresholds there as well. Uh, this is the data for this current year. So that's uh, just been given to us by uh, ADAS. Uh, ...and so forth, um, because obviously we've got low plant populations, even having a relatively no number of uh, cabbage uh, cabbage root fly, wheat bulb fly, um, will be uh, a concern. Um, so those figures are, are also on the on the website. So aphids. Um, well, yes, we used to have lots of things that we could use on, on aphids. Um, uh, certain aphids have become very resistant. Obviously, the biggest issue with aphids is transmission of viruses, in most cases, a few exceptions. Uh, but in terms of arable reduction, we're probably thinking about BYDV. Uh, for the most part. So we've got uh, different levels of resistance with different species, but what we do have is a fairly good uh, national monitoring system and then some also some more specific monitoring, certainly in the area of potatoes using yellow water traps uh, to bring us up to date. So this is Mises Persky, which is the, the champion of aphids in terms of resistance. Um, as you can see here, it has resistance to chlorpyrifos. Well, that's withdrawn from use anyway, so um, not so much problem. Uh, Neonic seed treatment, it doesn't have resistance, but we've had that withdrawn on all seed rape. Um, and then primicarb, it does have resistance, um, but that was withdrawn last summer anyway. Um, it's kind of depressing, really, when you look at it like this. However, pimetrazine um, doesn't have resistance. Thyclopyrid, no resistance. So there are still some tools available to, to use uh, against Mises Persky uh, in all seed rape should that become necessary and obviously uh, transmission of uh, turnip yellows virus would be a, would be a concern there. Uh, for the grain aphid, um, not so bad in terms of resistance, it's only really resistant to, shows a level of resistance to pyrethroids. Uh, we've still got the, the, the issue of uh, withdrawals of, of, um, uh, of products. Um, so better able to do that, but understanding when to make that application uh, is important, certainly in the autumn if we're talking about controlling uh, BYDV. Uh, so we do provide uh, information through aphid news on the incidence uh, of aphids. How do you sample them? Well, you have a big vacuum cleaner in effect. Uh, so this thing is uh, 12 meters high and it sucks air in uh, at quite a rate, uh, enough to suck in birds, which is why it's got a little wire cage on the top. Um, best not to sample those, it's been discovered. Uh, anyway, it makes a mess when it gets through to this point. So you collect the catch, count the number of aphids, uh, the ones that are of interest. Uh, that information, well, that's what it looks like. So there are people who sit their entire lives looking at petri dishes full of aphids. So your job's quite easy, I think, in comparison. So there's 600 different species and they will recognize them all. Um, and what that gives us is the ability to look at the changes in populations over time. And this information can be gleaned from uh, the Rothamsted Insect Survey website. Um, and I'm probably about to try something rather foolish, uh, but I had hoped that um, if I press the right keys, uh, we can go, go live, as they say, uh, to, to the website. So this is the latest data. Um, so you can go into this website yourself, you can choose particular traps, you can choose particular crops and it will give you the aphids relevant to that crop and you can see where the latest information was. So the previous slide I had on there was for 2015 and 16, the blue and red lines. This is now 2016 and 17. 
and it's even too small for me to read here. Um, but nonetheless, you can see the green bars are the average, and this gives you some idea of how the conditions this year relate to previous years. So you can start to understand whether the threat is bigger, smaller, or about the same as usual. Uh, is that right? It is. So that was an example for Rittle, pay dye on all seed rape. You'd be looking at that information. Similarly, uh, sorry, pay dye on cereals, and similarly, Mises Persicae are on all seed rape. And then that is the bulletin that we send out. You can sign up for that if you haven't already done so, uh, and it will come through in your email every week um, whilst those suction traps are running. So they'll run for another few weeks, probably, until it turns cold and there's no more aphids flying, and then pick up again in the spring. So it's intelligence you can get, these weekly reports, uh, combined suction traps and the yellow water traps for potatoes, um, and indeed for sugar beet in some instances we can get information, uh, and we will also include virus warnings, so we can monitor uh, the level of virus in some of the aphids as well, and feed that through. So again, information available on the fact sheet, uh, pollen beetle, friend or foe, that's the question I guess. Um, Another one, pyrethroids, uh, seeing some level of uh, uh, resistance. Um, oh, that's interesting. Uh, we've got um, a pollination purpose. So we've got pollinators in the crop, obviously, at the time that we've got pollen beetles. Uh, the key is to make sure that you take action at the right point. So you can leave it too late and you think, oh, I can see lots of pollen beetles on my rape flowers you actually missed the point where you should be treating them. So you're really looking at treating it when the pollen beetles are on the uh, green-yellow bud stage. Um, so a number of products available. Um, some are only available for single use in the crop, uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, another one uh, to, 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 to keep track of. And, and there is information about that put out on the Bayer website. So using research funded by HDB in the past, you can get uh, a bulletin of pollen beetle uh, catches and migrations as well. Is it still working? Oh. Right, so I thought it was going to come together. So this just gives you uh, an overview of the sort of thing that you can see. So you get migration started, um, and then it, migration starts in the next few days and not started. So you can uh, see how it progresses uh, if you've got good conditions. So this is what you're aiming to do. You're not aiming to make the treatment here. So you've, you've missed the risk period. Um, so that can help you inform, make a, a, a better decision, hopefully, as well. So pollen beetles, similarly. So we've got a number of challenges. Um, I'm sure you agree. They are real challenges. And it's not you know, disinterested. It's not the problems of, of government. It relates to you and how you use uh, the products we have. Um, we can do a job better with IPM, and I think it's important that it gets pushed, and government need, needs to, uh, to think, I guess, harder about how it might support that. Um, and I think there's also the other issue is about how we prepare the industry uh, for the problems that might be coming down the road, whether that be through climate change or, or so forth. Um, so that's me done. Thank you very much.